Good afternoon. Christ is risen. All right, and now more people know the answer. Okay, thank you so much for joining us on this, the holiest day of the Christian year. Uh, before I get, get started, I want to take the opportunity to say thanks to a few people. Uh, thanks again to the folks who are part of our Wednesday night sermon discussion group. I was thinking about you as I was getting this sermon together. Um, I really enjoyed our fellowship and our conversation. And so, uh, and I believe it made a difference in my preaching too. So, thank you for taking part in the experiment. And on a similar note, I just want to take a moment now to say thank you to everyone who contributes to making 6 a success. Our mission is to connect people to each other and to God and to making a difference. So whether you help connect people to each other by bringing snacks or liking us on Facebook, or if you run the projectors so people can connect to God in worship, or if you speak up for justice in your everyday life or as part of one of our service projects, thank you. This church thing is a team effort, and your contributions make a difference. Which sounds really like PBS, uh, but I mean it. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Wonderful and mysterious God, we see all too clearly the power of death in our lives. Open our eyes to see your life-giving spirit at work. Heal our hearts. Free us from sin. Give us the power to forgive those who have hurt us. And call us anew to be your Easter people, redeemed by the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus, who is our teacher, brother, and friend. In his name we pray. Amen. So death is a part of life. It's a part of the natural order of things. In fact, without death we couldn't have life, at least not as we know it. Even the simple act of eating our three square meals a day is possible only because plants and animals each day give up their lives so we can eat. And our own deaths walk with us too, like shadows in the corners of our eyes. I wake up some mornings with my back aching, and that's something that never, it never used to do, even during that year when I slept on this terrible ancient mattress. Or I comb my hair a little differently, and suddenly there's a raft of gray hairs that I never noticed before. And I know that what some of you are going to say, uh, which is that I'm still young and it only gets worse, right? I know, that's exactly my point. Little reminders day after day that we're getting older, and they get louder and more persistent as we go along. And then there is the face that death wears when it takes our loved ones away. The voice that we loved, the handwriting that we would puzzle out, the funny look that made us laugh, the little kindnesses, the quiet and faithful prayers. Whether we've lost a pet or a parent, a brother, a sister, a friend, a husband or wife or even a child, Death takes a costly toll on each of us. It is sad, of course, terribly, terribly sad, but that's the way that things work. Death is a part of life, and that's what those women expected to find that Easter morning. More of the same thing they'd known their whole life, more death. And in this case, they were ready, with set faces, to see death at its most brutal, the bloody death of one who died unjustly, and much too soon. They woke early that day, wanting to care for their friend's body as soon as they could, to add spices, to smooth his skin and comb his hair, to close his eyes and fold his hands, to honor his body one last time, to say goodbye. It would have been a very sad procession, a very sad file of women on their way to Jesus in the dark, But death is a part of life, and they know that. They're ready to do their duty, to care for him one last time, to say thank you and farewell. So when they get there to the tomb with their bundles and bowls, ready to do their tender work, it's a shock. Instead of finding Jesus' dead body, there is nothing. And suddenly some young men in dazzling clothes appear, and ask, why are you looking for the living 
among the dead. These strange messengers question the terrified women, which, if you think about it, is not really a fair question. Have you ever tried to take a drink of water from a water fountain and you lean over and you open your mouth and you hit the bar and then nothing comes out? Imagine someone coming over and saying, why are you trying to get water from that broken water fountain? Um, well, I didn't know it was broken. All right? That's why. Because they didn't know. They're looking for the living among the dead because they didn't know Jesus was alive. Maybe they should ask these messengers why they're hanging out at the tomb if it's so obvious that Jesus was going to be resurrected. Of course, that's the kind of question you think of later after the opportunity to do a good uh, response has passed. At any rate, whether it's, you know, you're like, oh, I should have said this. Oh. Anyway, whether it's a rhetorical question or not, the situation did need some explanation for the women, so the messengers walked them through it. Remember that time, they prompt, when Jesus was giving a talk, and he said, I'm going to die and come back to life three days later? Do you remember that? And do you remember how you didn't really get what he was talking about at the time? Do you remember now? Does it make sense now? And they remember, and it all clicks into place. And they hustle out there to tell Jesus' men disciples, who mostly think they're crazy. Peter gets a hint of something, though, and he jumps up and runs to the tomb and looks in. No Jesus. But he doesn't see any heavenly messengers either, so he's not sure what to think. It's all very up in the air. What could this all mean? The thing is, Easter comes in the spring, and when we start seeing the trees bud, and when we start seeing the new seedlings pushing up through the earth, and those early bulbs start blooming, daffodils and crocuses, maybe even tulips, it all goes in a cycle, spring and summer, fall and winter, life and death and new life again. But the resurrection is something else. It's not part of a cycle. It's outside the natural order of things. With the resurrection, death takes a new shape. No longer is death simply a part of life. Now life is a part of death by God's grace. This isn't simply new life coming into the world. This is the end of death as we knew it. Death as we knew it was final. Now there is something more. Death as we knew it was the end. Now it is a beginning. Death as we knew it was the last word. But now we know not to put a period where God wants a comma. Because even in the face of death, God is still speaking. God is still speaking love. God is still speaking forgiveness. God is still speaking joy. God is still speaking life. Does this mean that there is no more pain? No more death? No. We know that they have continued. But now a seed of hope has been planted in the barren land. On the dark horizon, there is a glimmer of light. There is a crack in the stone wall where before there had only been a hard, flat, smooth, dead end. Death as we knew it has come to an end. And the other thing this resurrection means comes not from what the what of it, but the who of it. It means so much that Jesus was the one who was resurrected. Jesus, who taught us about a kingdom of God, a new social order, a way of living life together, marked by justice, love, and trust in God. Jesus, who healed our wounds, forgave our sins, and called us to live together in community. Death as a tool of oppression and control crumbles in Rome's hands when Jesus rises from the dead. Jesus, who was born a nobody and died a criminal's death. This is who God becomes. This is who is resurrected. This is who turns death inside out. This is the one whose way we follow. Death as we knew it has come to an end, and the kingdom of God has just begun. Thanks be to God. Amen.